everybody welcome to our little podcast i'm mike from sparkle jet uk i'm joined here today by my band members susan west hey and jamie knight hello yes and we're here to talk about our upcoming uh album project called best of friends which is a collection of songs uh from back in the 20 years ago in the pop scene when we met all of our cool musician friends in los angeles and uh we had the idea to record a bunch of their songs. It just took us 20 years to make it, but here it is, here we are. And we've invited all of our friends to come and talk to us about that and the songs and anything we want to talk about. And our guest today is Morley Bartonoff, also known infamously as Cosmo Topper. Say hi. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. And thanks for covering my song, Are We There Yet? Right on. Our pleasure. It was a hard choice picking what song to do. Uh, because we liked them so much. Uh, but that was kind of, I know Susan had, had a particular affection for, as she calls it, Star 69. Yes. Which that should good. be the parentheses title. Actually. There we go. Yeah. yeah. And I think 1999, right? They actually had that. So if you were familiar with that area, you would know what that means. That's right. Yeah. That was where you could, uh, if someone called you and you didn't pick up in time, you could, you know, call it, call that same number back. And it was shocking to people that didn't know that you had that option. And sometimes right. they called you either by mistake or on purpose. And you know what I mean? It was it was definitely part of the early spy era. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Star 69. It was a quarter to three. Why do you call me collect? You're torturing me. The e chakra heart hates street 4th of July. One way crush torn apart Love song denied Divine ignites the spark It defines this love I've found Divided equal hearts
Yeah, nice piano part on there, by the way. I really liked it. I feel like I should fly that piano part into my version. Very cool. Well, what happened there is uh, we'd done the whole track and it can't except for the lead vocal and i'd done like a little placeholder vocal and it was a it was beautiful and everything was perfect and then um susan went to sing it and she's like guys it's too low can we can we change the key can we do it higher it's like the track was really good and it was done man so what i did is i said you know i'll try something and i uh i went in and i used the computer to jack up the pitch on all the parts i didn't have to do it to the drums obviously and that's why that gave the, give the track a little extra sparkle like that it's yes. just because sparkle jet actually yeah that's what happens when you speed up tape even though it wasn't tape yeah i really enjoy the arrangement and your voice and it's really cool hearing other people interpret your songs i received really two two different great compliments on that song and one is from one of the artists you cover Ah. on your record which is Stu, he actually threatened to cover it one night at third thursday speaking of 1999 at highland <laughs> grounds which is now cat and fiddle i think and when i yes. went there he goes yeah i want you to come and back me up and he was doing the set and when i got there he told me you know i'm just not confident enough to do it but you know thanks for coming to my show but it was still really a great moment that he wanted to do it right and then the other compliment i got from it was Steve Kilby of the church. And that's one of my favorite bands. I think I I look at the church the way most people look at Pink Floyd. So I had just my friend, Rob Hasek, who's the bass player of Andy and the Rattlesnakes and Burning Sensations, two bands I was in. And he sat in with Cosmo Topper and he's the artist. And he did kind of an animated interpretation of that song. And I posted it one day And I got this private message from Kilby, the main songwriter of the church, and said, that's a really cool song, and the artwork is particularly cool. So there's a little bit of supplemental information about my experience with that song. Wow. Well, this was from uh, your big record, Pure Fast Vibration, which you've just released again. Um, You did a big vinyl run. I think I bought about 20 copies of it. Yeah, you've been always supportive, man. I appreciate <laughs> it. Well, I like to have uh, I, it's it's an important record for me. I wanted to make sure I had a copy everywhere I might go. So I just kind of leave them here and there. You know, um, I want to say something about that. And, you know, up until September of last year, the only way you were going to find any of my music besides YouTube with some songs was from the CD that you purchased and 300 other people bought and that I just put out personally. And then Um, This cool little label out of Arizona, Smelly Rick and Tim Tim said, listen, I've got this little label. It's not massive. You're not going to be rich, but I want to put out your record in vinyl. I'll take care of everything. And here's what you're going to get from it. And so that was in September. And that was the first step. We did a bunch of bonus tracks in Bandcamp. You can find me. Michael has found me there. But a few weeks ago, we signed up with DistroKid. And now all your favorite streaming services has that album. I just got a free month on Amazon and they actually have it on super high def. They don't have it on most or whatever that pseudo surround thing is, but the record has never sounded better this week than it has when we recorded it in 2000, 2001 on like early digital recorders. And I want to say a couple of the weird sound effects that you hear or the intros are from my four track cassette machine that Joel Bell, the producer, flew in to give it as much of the analog attempt that we thought about recording that album. We named both sides and in our mind, it was an album. So it was a real thrill to be able to do it on actual vinyl and now i'm talking to him i want to do a limited run of 180 gram we'll see if that can happen next year wow i know what's this i know there's another thing that you just posted about that has a few is it just an is it a regular vinyl release i know it's collecting some of the extra songs yes i want to talk that's really cool you're mentioning it I, i i sent you that virtual player did it work that virtual record player 
I forgot to check okay, it out. I've been I so think busy. it will work and you should check it out because it works like a real record player. And I think it's probably broadcast quality. But anyway, to answer your question, yeah, um, Hotel Cosmo Topper, you know, the, the right. Hotel Cosmo Topper collection. What that is are some alternative versions, um, singles or, that were are on Bandcamp but were never on the album. I mean, I had a chance to do put it out on vinyl. It's only available on Bandcamp as vinyl, but I'm really excited about it because I think both the sound quality, it was stuff recorded after your fast vibrations. As a matter of fact, it goes all the way up to 2019. Maybe there's something from 2020. So it updates a lot of the history of pure fast vibration. And I'm really excited about it. And uh, it's, you know, I've, I'm, I'm having tomorrow. I have three different things that are coming out either through streaming sites. I, I'm actually releasing Dog Georgie um, by Morley Bartnoff and the Randy Californians. You'll be able to find that everywhere on all your streaming services. And that's coming out the same time as Hotel Cosmo Topper. And so I've gone from doing absolutely nothing. I think old age has motivated me to leave something for people to say, you know what? He just didn't stay in his room and watch TV. So that's my intention. Awesome. We we, <laughs> we particularly like the dog Georgie song. I'm happy about that. Because yeah. we, we have a dog here named Georgie as well. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Good little dog and his name is Georgie. He takes care of his mommy and his brother Morley. He's a good little doggy Georgie. His name is Dog George and he lives in West Hills. And once he accidentally ate some chocolate and a booze, he was a stone little doggy Georgie. He was as high as a doggy could be. His name is Georgie. Oh, oh, dog Georgie. Even when it's a song about a dog, it gets all fancy and pretty and nice. Well, and you know, at the end, Georgie does make an appearance barking. And that's one of my favorite parts is that he's actually on the track. And everything in that song lyrically is true, right? It's every single, it mentions his, the groomer and the people that would take him for a walk when I couldn't be here. And uh, yeah, Georgie, <laughs> there he goes. He, he wants royalties. His agent called me and said he, he's a publisher. 
what in the first i was listening to the first verse is he said they ate some chocolate and then and what else chocolate edibles and that's oh, when, I, oh, when i was still geez. partaking in my younger clueless cheech and chong era um i mistakenly took a bite of this edible that i'd gotten from a dispensary and i spaced out and left chocolate at a place where he could grab it and so he, not and only was it poisonous saw, chocolate it was full of thc chocolate well. edibles and it was yeah and it had a significant amount particularly for a small dog of cannabis and you know i actually had to take him to the dog hospital and i was actually very scared about it until they called me the next morning but the the doctor said the following thing to me we get five or six of these cases in every week and wow. and here's the weird thing this particular thing had caffeine chocolate and cannabis <laughs> in it and actually what they told me he was so buzzed I should have taken a picture. He was fine. It took him like 36 hours to come down. But he was so buzzed. And the doctor said to me, there wasn't enough cannabis or the chocolate to really hurt him. But they were worried about the caffeine. It was such an education for me because caffeine in a dog's heart could be challenging. But I'm telling you, that was a mistake I never made again. But it was very real and it was very scary for about 24 hours. Oh, God. Well, do we know any similar stories to that? Yes, that Mike. We're willing, we that do. we're willing to share? Um, yeah. Okay, let's hear yeah. it. Lay it on, well, no. no, it was just, uh, I think, uh, well, our dogs are very small. She's She was only like eight pounds then. It's a miniature dachshund. And, um, this is Georgie we're talking about. Georgie. The, fe Georgie. the female Georgie. The female Love Georgie. Yeah. yeah. And so we had gone, we'd gone away and left our dog in the care of our son, and his girlfriend and the dog was acting weird right when we got back we go that's strange what's and it, it i think it was just a, it was like a she ate a joint she ate a whole joint and they said oh it was just a half a joint it's okay and then she was just being weird and just kind of huh, kind of a little shy actually that's what it did to her and Love we it. took we had to go to the hospital doggy hospital in the middle of the night because we we're thinking this is this could take a turn for the worst. And we went to this one hospital that was open and we were there with, uh, there, I remember there was a, a prostitute there that had just picked a cat up that just got hit by a car. And there, they were fighting with the people at the, the hospital because they're saying, we're just, the lady just wanted to leave the cat there and she's in her full outfit for work, if you know what I mean. And yeah. they wouldn't take, they wouldn't, they didn't want to take it. No, no, we're not going to take it. No, you have to take it, the cat. And then we're just, it was surreal. We felt that we had had, um, had partaken in something because it was just such a surreal thing. And then about, we, 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 didn't, we didn't get her back for a, a like a, a full day and a half. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, I get it. But the funny thing is, was how normal the experience was for the doctor that was looking out. She was yeah. very nice. But she said, you wouldn't believe the number of times I have to deal with this on a weekly basis. Wow. Now, now, Georgie's like a Yorkie, right? Or a Yorkie Maltese he's terrier, mix? He's kind of mostly a terrier. And, uh, you know, he's definitely, I, I've had I've had pets. I'm both a cat and dog person, but I've had more dogs. But we are so bonded. I mean, I don't have any children, but I understand this when he is the closest thing I could ever have to a kid. We are that bonded. And he's totally great. And he eats as much as I do. And I told him I have to get a job just because he eats so much food. <laughs> well, we feel that way about our dogs, too. We are yeah, totally I get bonded. It. Yeah. Hard to explain to people that, you know what I mean? You're yeah. either in it or not. That's it. Right. There's no in between. Yeah. No I do have one more funny cannabis dog story about Chico the Chihuahua that I'll <laughs> lay on you if we have All time. Right. I'll do it. Story. Yeah. And I was first jamming with musicians in very high school in Las Vegas. My mother perceptively brought me this mic that you could actually put into a piano and it amplified it really semi okay. And one weekend they were out of town or they went away, my mom and dad, and I invited the cool musicians over, drummer and bass player, and we jammed and they brought some pot. And it was very strong. And I remember we were playing and then all of a sudden we were looking for the pot and it was gone. And we were always a little freaked out about it. And then my mom came home 
and said, what's wrong with Chico? He's acting really weird. And he was stumbling. And it was like, just like a Cheech and Chong movie, but worse. (laughs) And she went under the bed and there he had taken the whole baggie of what was this bark strong pot. It was like bark, like hard. You had to break it up. Whatever it was he had eaten, someone was very high and then started getting sick. And then my, I told my mom it was black cherry tobacco. Don't ask yeah. me. Good she save. went to have it analyzed by the drugstore. And Uh-oh. she came back in and said, do you know what this is? And so I was on restriction and wound up missing concerts by Credence and Cream at the Las Vegas Ice Palace. Because oh, no. Pico busted me. <laughs> Damn dog. I'm telling you, man. Never Damn. trust a chihuahua. I'm telling you, Chico was like, you know, it was Chico the man. He got me busted. He narked out on me. <laughs> wow. Your mom was really at the top of her mom game. That was, was, and I remember my dad kind of defending me a little bit. It was like, well, Ruth, you know what Bobby Kennedy said. And maybe I don't know what Bobby Kennedy said, but I was on restriction. And, you know, it was just one of those things. One last funny end story was that. When my friends who were with me and brought it signed my yearbook, they didn't want my mom to know it was them, so they spelled their names backwards when they in the yearbook, so my mom wouldn't see it and say, "Not those people that ruined my kid." (laughs) Oh my god, that's awesome! I think you just do your own podcast, Marley. You've got. I appreciate it. I I appreciate you guys doing this. It's. uh, I'm glad we figured it out because technology is always a sticky wicket. Not that I haven't done this before, but I think my browser was like fighting us. But now we're here. Be here now. That's right. That's right. We had a. Yeah, I had. I had a a dog that looked a lot like Georgie named Ringo. And uh, one time I accidentally gave. Well, it wasn't an accident. I gave him a piece of chocolate because I didn't know any better. And then I did it again, like a few days later. And he he was so sick. He was sick for like a week in the hospital. And I when I finally said, you know what, I I did give him this piece of chocolate, and they were like, oh, that's what's wrong. Okay, come get your dog. Uh, it was really bad. And once I gave Winston here a, a what right. is it, a grape, and the second I gave it to him, I go, you know what, I don't know if I wonder if I can give him grapes. I looked it up, and it's like one grape can kill your dog. It's like. I know there has there needs to be a printed out list because there's a fair amount of things that are right. are just okay and other things are not okay at all. Yeah, I've printed some and I have and I have them in my phone. But the thing is, basically, the rule of thumb for me now is if you don't know, if you don't know you for do sure, it. look it yeah. up or don't do it. And and I and it's I don't think it's uh, the end of the world. We used to just feed our dogs literally anything and they were always okay. I think it's one of those things where most of them probably will be fine, but the occasional dog won't be okay. And it's kind of how we have to treat the kids now with all their allergies and yeah, always. Listen, I have a question for you guys. I really was checking out your record and I was, I was listening to it and I knew I recognized, I think I recognize cockeyed ghost and stew songs, (laughs) but I'd like to know the art. You don't have to name all 21 if it takes up too much time, but I'd like to know the other artists that you cover on your record. Oh, does it not? I guess it wouldn't say, would it? Um, well, I can tell you. Uh, Good. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that, and I'm I'm enjoying it, and I'm going to listen to it. And when it's okay, I want to promote it, so you let me know when that is. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. we did uh, so one a band called The Seesaw. We did Walter Clevenger, The Dairy Kings, Masticators, yeah. uh, yeah. Andersons, Carrie Compost. Yeah. Uh, Wonder Mints. Cockeyed Ghost. Yeah. Adam Daniel. Um, Candy Pants. Candy. The Dawns, yeah, we did a Candy Pants song. Yeah, good. And uh, we did Big Hello and The Negro Problem. We did a couple of those. Yeah, Monsanto and what's the other one? Uh, Come Down Now. Oh, I love that song. Yeah, we did The Sugar Plastic and uh, yeah, that's about it, I think. What a great idea to do that. And let, let's talk about that scene a little bit. Yes, you um, were there before me, so lay it I, on us. I, you know what? I think it's hard to to tell people how cool that scene is and be so i want to talk about how cool poptopia was and tony and of course david was there and i'm 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 gonna hype myself for a second i'm gonna play my first international pop overthrow show sometime early august at the redwood i don't have a date yet it's the first time i've played it in 10 years it's the first cosmo gig i played so i'm excited about that but here's what i wanted to say two things 
Third Thursday at Highland Grounds and the early Wild Honey shows right around that same time period was kind of like the blueprint for so much of what was going on. Eventually, I know there were shows at the Whiskey and at uh, the Roxy, Wonderments, Negro Problem, Baby Lemonade, and John Bryan was playing all the time, and the Grays and Jellyfish. It was such a great time for melodic, harmony, power pop songs, and L.A. really had a cool scene that seemed to support itself. It may not have translated into gigantic major record deal things, but, man, it's the last real scene that I kind of remember where you had many bands and people would go support each other's bands and there'd be two or three bands on the same bill, be it at Spaceland. Or... It was a fun time, man. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I remember kind of seeing it happen even before I met uh, these guys, and I didn't really know what was going on. I just remember seeing stuff in, like, BAM magazine and hearing about bands like uh, Baby Lemonade and The Negro Problem, and I was obviously listening to The Grays and Jellyfish, and I knew it was kind of all based here in L.A., and we were going to, we were going to Largo all the time to see John Bryan and all that yeah. stuff, and... uh and then once we start, once we first started playing in L.A., we finally got to meet everybody. And uh, yeah, where did you come from, Michael? Originally, before here? Um, well, I've always lived. We've all always lived here. Um, right. It's just we Orange I, County. Well, kind of. They at the time I met these guys, they were living in Orange, and I was um, I was in Whittier, I think, or somewhere, somewhere like that. But really, like, Fullerton was your big center. Fullerton, you know? eventually, yeah I, yeah, I moved to Fullerton. And so we were doing stuff out there. Um, but we were always L.A. County people. We, we just happened to be down there for a little while. Um, we're all back in Long Beach now. Right. Did you and Susan meet being in a band or did that how that met or how, what's the history there? Well, Susan was, you know, Susan and Jamie had the uh, many bands they'd been in, uh, original and cover bands. And I think uh, we we're playing in a, occasionally in a small little circuit of open mic nights that was happening around Orange County. Sure. And we, so we know some similar people and uh, I kind of met them by accident. They were doing a, like a three song, you know, get up and play thing one day. And, and, and uh, they, I don't know how it happened, but I just, they asked around like, is anyone like Neil Diamond? And I said, yes. And I went up and sang and joined them on a song. And that was the first time I'd ever met them. And then, uh, it just threw different uh, things later on. A few months later, we ended up playing, t doing stuff. And uh, we, ha we had, to, I was in another band. We asked Jamie to sit in with us on bass for a couple gigs and we did. And then we eventually just got, we were, we had all the people involved. There was about four different bands or, or at least four different songwriters, four or five songwriters. And we just kind of, it was what was, what really happened that mattered is these guys were the first people to ever be willing to, to learn any of my songs and let me sing them. Cause the band I was in, the guy just, you know, his ego would not allow that. Um, he would give me a lot of lip service. Yeah, we'll do your songs. I maybe put them on one of the demo tapes, but when it came to gigs, he never ever let me do any of my stuff because sure. he wouldn't learn it. He would just not bother. Um, but they were willing to learn my stuff. And basically we spun all those guys off and became our own thing. So, and then we started playing gigs with the, with the Negro problem somehow or other. I don't. I don't. We're, I know we're going to probably talk to them today, and none of us. I don't really have a recollection how we met them, but we were bringing them down to do Orange County shows. Uh, Are we you talking them. to both Stu and Heidi? Uh, hopefully, yeah. Uh, to later on today. Yeah. But, make um, sure you tell. Make sure you tell them I said hello. Oh, I will.
um, I have a quick John Bryan story, which was a big fantasy thing that I couldn't believe happened. It's very short, but one night, one Friday night, I forget who his special guest was that night. It could have been Elliot Smith. I don't remember. But uh, we were there at Largo across from Canners, and somebody had given him a copy of the first song on Pure Fast Vibration, The Law of Attraction. Yeah. On a mixtape, not the whole album, right? And I I didn't know that at the time. I found out later. But we're sitting there waiting for the show, and uh, Flanagan introduces John, and John comes up. He comes walking by, and we're at, the, we're at one of the tables, and he stops at our table and points at me and says, that Law of Attraction song is fucking great. Oh, I'm sorry. Wow. Cool. And and, and wow. then Red walked up on stage. That was it. But it was just one of those moments. And I turned to Diana. I said, did that actually happen? You know, it was like so quick. He was on his way to the stage. It was one of those weird moments, right? And I guess really what I'm saying is that I've gotten a little clues like that. And there's one more big one I mentioned on the liner notes of the album. Is that one afternoon, I've had a crazy idea that since Michael Nesmith was on Facebook, that I was going to send him for the time being in Messenger, because I don't know why I thought he would like it. It was in the Rodney movie in the soundtrack at the end credits. Then I had this. I was compelled to send it to him. I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to send it to him. And I went to go get some lunch, and I came back, and there was a message from Michael Nesmith. It was very short. It wow. said, pause. This is a great song, Nez. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. So it's like, I'm just oh saying, like, God. people might say, why? It's weird how you say this, right? Because I've never made a lot of money from music. I've made more money playing with other bands or sessions, but never on my own. But it's things like that, right? that make you say, hey, just keep going, just do it. It's weird to say that, but it's the feedback from other people. Are you supporting it and buying my music? It's kind of little things. It's the little things. It's the inspiration that lets you keep going. I don't know. I think it's a huge thing. Jamie has a story like that with Brian Wilson. Oh, I want to hear it. He has the tape. No, no basically, uh, basically, we did... Uh, I created this uh, pop music program with Mike with for the high school kids. And one year we got brave and we did uh, Pet Sounds in like 2007 or 2008. And then uh, when we were there, we had Carol Kay play bass with the kids. And the whole the whole Brian Wilson band was there except for Brian. And then uh, the next day when I'm teaching class, my phone is vib- uh, vibrating in my pocket and I go, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it later. And so then when I get home and I'm listening to my voicemail and this guy says, Hey, Jamie, it's Jeffrey Foscott. I have somebody here that wants to say something to you. Hold on. Hello, Jamie. This is Brian Wilson here with Jeffrey Foscott. I want to thank you for playing the Pet Sounds for those people. I, I love that album, too. And thank you very much. That is so great. God, that's great. Jamie, thank you for playing that album for those people. I like that album a lot, too. <laughs> that's just a moment, man. That's a moment. And, and, you know, it's cool because, well, the two degrees of separation is that Proben Gregory plays on a lot of the Cosmo songs, and Nelson is on one or two things. And, uh, you know, I've always been really appreciative of those guys. I've seen some great shows. I saw some crazy show at the Roxy where they only did obscure songs. Yeah. They did no hits. And I was, it was there. Like, were you there that night? Yep. Okay. Well, so do you remember this one crazy story that at one point, Diana and I were like really close. Like I remember we were watching. It was one of those weird, rare moments where – we could stand close. We were really there. And Probin looked at us during one song. He was about to take a solo, and he did it. I got the feeling partially to blow my mind, and he laid back on his back, and he did, like, little turned arounds like he was a crazy rock guy playing a solo. And <laughs> later he told me that Brian lectured him and said, don't ever do that, Probin. You scared me. I thought you were having an attack. <laughs> so that happened. Oh my god. That doesn't surprise me at all. 
right? You can kind of see it. I can right? totally see it. It's spinning we around laughing. in a circle. We thought it was one of the greatest things since sliced bread. And, you know, and it was part of Crazy Probin's personality. He has that in him. He can be very shy, but he has that kind of crazy intellect hippie thing going on at the same time. So it was kind of perfect. And it was one of those shows, right? Like it was, I don't think that show has ever happened again where it was nothing but all your favorite deep album tracks, none of the hits. Well, it's, they were, they had been tr testing the waters with him for a while. And, and that was one of those proving ground shows where, you know, they kind of wanted to do that low pressure and let him see the audience response, which of course was crazy. Um, and because yeah. of that really is, is when they started doing the nutty stuff, like let's actually talk about making smile happen and all that. It was just really a direct result of, of that and they them sneaking deep cuts into shows like you know as the tours would go by and their rehearsals they'd i guess what what daring told me is sometimes they'd work up a song like some weird track and they would have the band learn it you know surreptitiously and they would make sure that they were just kind of playing the music when brian would walk in and yeah. he would just walk in and sit down and kind of be like oh or maybe sing along or listen to it and go that was really good we should we should do that that's great. They kind of just set, subtly implied yeah. the fact, look how great this sounds, and then it could be added. Yeah, and that's how they kind of got it to move that direction, and thank God they did. Uh, it's, it's been an amazing uh, c couple decades now of, of that stuff. Amazing. And if it wasn't for them, movie. they wouldn't have happened. You know, they really yeah, I, I, I really like to hear the roots. You know, speaking in 1999, I want to mention the fact I've been part of the Wild Honey Orchestra, which you've participated in a couple of those shows, too. Uh, yeah, Michael. When, when, when they when they remember me. Yeah. Well, you know, and listen, I understand how that goes, because sometimes, listen, I've been with them since the very beginning when it, the first show was at Paul Rock's house with 45 people. So I go way back. But the next show, I want to say a couple things is. Like Highland Grounds, the early Wild Honey shows was kind of like a farm league, like Brian kind of saw the wonderments and then do songs on the same day that he was a special guest at a 200-seat theater, the Morgan Wixon. The Dave Davies band, Andrew and, and Jenkins and Christian Hoffman, all those people kind of formulated at Wild Honey. Uh, I remember Baby Lemonade, playing love songs. Eventually they became Arthur's band. And my connection with Drama Rama for 20 years began because I would be on the same bill with the John Easdale solo band. And somehow we would see each other play. And then somehow how I wound up sitting in with them on one or two songs. And then I wound up being in this PBS special with them. And then we did this massive crazy gig for K-Rock. And then that led to me being their kind of occasional keyboard player for 20 years. I'm on the new record, which is called Color TV, which is a great record that people don't really know about it because anything, anything is so iconic and kind of overrides almost any song they ever do. But it's really a great record if I can hype that. Color TV on Pasadena Records, which is a label put together by ex Electra people. Mm. And this is drama rama, not banana rama. Right, which is definitely confused at time, but yeah. Drama Rama, the single most uh played band in the history of KROQ, actually, besides like Bowie and Billy Idol. And then the other thing is if you do a search in YouTube on anything, anything, there are five hundred to a thousand covers. Wow. wow. You'd be you'd be actually shocked. It's kind of the the Louie Louie of alternative radio. That doesn't surprise me. I remember at the time I was there was this girl in my high school that she she didn't she never had a ride home and so and it was kind of on our way so sometimes I would take her take her home um and she was way into them. She used to follow them around and sneak into their house and do crazy things. Yeah. But I just yeah, was like it's interesting. They're still kind of underground in that way, although people know the song. More people know that song than they know the name of the band. Bummer. One of the, yeah, it can be. But when they hear the song, there's recollection. But just finishing up the Wild Honey thing, Friday night, May 13th, is the Nuggets anniversary show with Lenny K as the host. And they've got people from Chocolate Watch Band, The Seeds, Johnny Echoes from Love. I'm going to play in the orchestra on a few songs. But they just got Peter 
Giles from the Jay Giles band, who was in some psychedelic band before that. And they've got a couple surprises. It's always a good thing. It's at the Alex Theater, uh, May 13th. That's my next gig. So I want to hype that. And that's a really cool organization. They, they try to do really cool things and, um, it's always a good evening and there's always surprise guests and they did great. Uh, you did the white album, didn't you, Michael? Yeah. And I, I can, I can address this weird problem that always happens for me. And I was going to say, Jamie, you should go to that nugget show because I can't this weird thing. That's always happened with every one of their shows, except the white album, which was weird. It's the, the white album show literally is the only one in, in like 15 years, I think, where we haven't had a big concert for my school that same weekend. I see. Right. Every February and every May, we have a huge show and it's always that weekend. And the only time it didn't. And even when we move it, well, like this, this, we just moved our show back a week. And so did they. It's weird. It's like they read my calendar. Yeah. Yeah. And they're juggling their schedule with the Alex theater, right? Which has stuff going in there all the time. So they have to find the right weekend. The other challenging thing for them is, So many of the people they really want to get on the bill are usually touring or they may not be anywhere near L.A. And a lot of people really want to do it. And the the awareness of Wild Honey is growing. Uh, The last show, big well, they did a big star show, which I didn't go to, but that was mostly people that were already touring that show. A lot of the same people, and they plugged in a few Wild Honey people. But the last real show was three years ago, and they reunited three of the Living Lovin' Spoonful members, plus Mark Sebastian, the brother that wrote, co wrote uh, Summer in the City, and the producer, Eric. Like that was the first time they'd all been at a concert together at the same time, and it was really amazing. Yeah, I got to do Pow! Uh, from uh, one of the soundtracks, Love and Spoonful, I think What's Up, Tiger Lily, and uh, John Easdale sang, and John Sebastian played harmonica. It was one of those moments, because I've been such a fan, a a fanboy since Do You Believe in Magic? And that's the cool thing about Wild Honey, is that sometimes you wind up playing with, or at the same concert with these people that you grew up listening to for decades, and they're on the same stage as you. Yeah, I got lucky the one time I got to go and be in it. uh, Dave Gregory from XTC was invited to play. And, and, you know, I'm I'm a huge XTC person. Sure. How could you not be? That freaked me out. And I subsequently got to meet all of them now. uh, That's very cool. Over over the years. So it's been been great. And they've all come to me, which is even better. That's even more interesting. You know, there's a great video on YouTube of – wild honey backing and dave is like shocked of mayor is simpleton it's not a perfect version but it's one of those spontaneous things where he gets yep. to play the guitar on them covering it at rehearsal i was there and, yeah I've you were it. there right so you yeah. saw it. Yeah. now do you remember the beatles producer that was there that both of them yes well one was at yeah one was that would only come to the show but one was at that rehearsal um, well i know a little bit about this because i was we were I was in the thick of that too. The people we're talking about is Jeff Emmerich and um, and uh, Ken Ken Scott. Yeah, and apparently they're not. They were not super friendly. They wouldn't so, be at the same place at the same time. Correct. So we so we had to tell one to come one day and one to come the next day. And I was doing that show and I just got my my Fender Bass Six and it was all I really had on me at the time. And I don't know just. I'm not a getting a guitar signed kind of guy, but it's all I had. So I flipped it over and and I, so I have on the back of my base six, it's autographed by two Beatles engineers, which is super dope. That is really cool. (laughs) Hey, is that Georgie? That's definitely Georgie. Georgie We ever need a second overdub on a new version of dog Georgie. We'll do a stereo mix of two Georgies barking. There you go. Um, I want to tell you my quick when. I did piggies, which you know, because I think, didn't you back me on that? Yes, at the well, I, I, th- I when, believe so. I, when I rehearsed it, that was, I, I actually was far more nervous rehearsing, right? And that rehearsal setting, it yep. was just one of those things because you're just right there. But I finished, here's what I remember so vividly about that rehearsal. I walked off and I went and sat down and I looked to my right and right next to me is Jeff Emmerich and he's nodding his head. So I go into fanboy mode. 
right? How can you not? I start talking about Elvis Costello, Imperial Bedroom. And before <laughs> I can get much further, he cuts me off. He says, yeah, the, he, goes, he said, that's fine. But that was a really cool version of Piggies. And so that that hearing it from him was another one of those moments. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I'm sitting next to Jeff Emmerich. And that's the album where he quit when Ken Scott came right? in to replace him. Makes you wonder. Yeah, there are a lot of emotions there. I, I bet you could feel it. I gotta. I'll have to look that up. But uh, yeah, that was a trip. That room, practicing in that room is way worse than the show. The show is just a show, and there's people. But yeah. in that rehearsal room, everybody in the room is a heavy cat. They're cats, I was, right? I was the least of the people in that room. Just about. I'm like I'm at the very bottom of that pecking order, and just looking around, going, Jesus Christ. Well, I wouldn't underestimate your accomplishments and let alone there's something real about teaching kids music and doing the thing you do, which is really a, a lot higher thing in a lot of ways than being a rock musician, which is cool and fun and all that. But I'm, there's a lot that you bring to the table. So there you go. Well, I'll take it. Uh, Jamie was Jamie was actually holding down the fort back at the school that day so I could go to that rehearsal. Is that that se- that sounds right, doesn't it, Jamie? Yeah, it does. And the education thing was really great that, you know, I I wound up meeting a close friend of yours. Uh, I was on the board of directors for the Association for Pop Music Education. And Andy is was a board member. Dr. Andy Cricken. I know I just talked to him yesterday. So when are you guys playing again? Well, that's a really funny, good question. A lot of us will see each other the first week of April. He comes in for Nam. The last gig we did was acoustically at May. Uh, a semi unplugged at three three clubs um the thing i'm really excited about is that his daughter and her wonderful boyfriend are working on a rattlesnakes documentary it's a little more than 50 wow. percent done and they showed it last may it's got a lot of cool footage it needs an arc and it needs to get into the educational part of what andy does now for the last 15 years because that's going to really tell the story and so that's what they need to shoot. I wish I could say it's going to be done in a year or so, but just the fact that it's in the pipeline is really excited. They, they're doing a great job. Um, I think what will happen is there's actually a record in the can, and I jokingly say whenever I ask when it's coming out, Andy tells me two or three reasons why it's not. It doesn't matter what's going on. So I don't quite know what it is, but I think maybe sometimes it's about the process. But he mentioned that he had connected with you guys, and I'm glad you reminded me of that. I was just talking to him on the phone. Our bass player, Rob, has been having some health issues, and we're wishing him the best. And, you know, we're at that age now, man. Like, I used to be the youngest person in all the bands, and now I'm by far the oldest. Well, we're not, we're all kind of there, man. In right, I hear you. At, at different uh, levels, but yes. Well, gee, I'm so excited that your music's coming back out and getting out there and people are hearing it and we're able to buy it. It's it's fantastic. I love I always love your vibe. And thanks, man. You're, you're, you're you have positivity all the time. And um, it's your kind of I don't know, your kind of Zen Buddhism rock thing that you do is uh, thanks it's for having me, man. Pretty and lovely. For the and, you know, people can listen and stream everywhere you would think, whether or not you support it, Spotify amazon uh uh itunes uh and you can even like when you go to in if you go to instagram and you go to all those things and there's a little music thing you can type in cosmo topper and all the songs will come up they only give you a minute or so whatever but you can listen to it and sample it and you can go to my band camp cosmo topper and everything is there Awesome. Right well, thank, thank you, Morley. I'm thank gonna, you, guys. I'm going to play a little Law of Attraction uh, uh, on our way out here, and we'll just say, uh, what, what's the line from that, the chorus? Uh, intend to have a perfect day, and joy will surround you. Perfect. Thanks, man. Thanks, everybody. Right, right on. on. Thank you. Thank you.